Listening activity number eleven. You are going to hear a talk about universities and colleges in Britain. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces. Every year, thousands of young people want to study in Great Britain. They come from a range of backgrounds and have varying expectations of what their study in the country will be like and how to apply to the university. Today, I'd like to talk on universities and colleges in Britain. There are forty-five universities, thirty polytechnics, and about one thousand major technical, commercial, education, and art colleges in the UK. In 1973 to 1974, there were over 251,200 full-time students in universities. Of whom almost ten percent were from overseas, a total of nearly two hundred and seventy-six thousand three hundred and fifty students attending full-time courses in establishments of further education, and about one hundred and thirty thousand two hundred and seventy in colleges of education. University first degree courses in arts and sciences are normally of three or four years duration. And with very few exceptions, students are not admitted for any shorter period of study. The academic year normally extends from October to June, and is divided into three terms. Information about courses and entrance requirements should be obtained by writing direct to the university at least twelve months before the proposed date of admission. All applications for admission are dealt with by the university's central council on admissions, the UCA, to which all candidates seeking admission to a full-time internal first degree course or a first diploma course of more than one year's duration must apply. Full details of the admission procedure are to be found in the UCA handbook, How to Apply for Admission to a University. A copy of this handbook. And the standard application form should be obtained from the UCA at PO Box 28, Cheltenham, and Gloucestershire, GL 501 HY. The application form must be returned to the UCA by a stated closing date, usually in December, October for Oxford and Cambridge. The UCA will continue to send application forms to universities for consideration at their discretion. For a limited period after the fifteenth of December, but candidates are strongly advised to ensure that their application forms reach the UCA by the stated closing date to help their chances of selection. Candidates who fail to obtain a place in the initial selection period are automatically put into the clearing house scheme in June, July, when these candidates' application forms are again sent to those universities which still have vacancies. Students from the following countries should send their application forms to the UCA via the Overseas Student Office of their own country in London, Bahamas, Brunei, Cyprus, Ghana, Guyana, India, Luxembourg, Singapore, Tanzania, Thailand, and Uganda. Graduates of a university in Britain or overseas who wish to take another first degree course should approach the university concerned to require whether it wishes them to apply direct or through the central UCA scheme. Now let's turn to transfer. It is very rare for a student who has begun a first degree course at one university in Britain to transfer to another British university with a view to completing it there. And there is no provision for the automatic granting of credit for university studies already undertaken. Students who have already completed some university-level study should make inquiries directly with the individual university. To be considered for admission, a candidate must show that his earlier education has qualified him to enter the course, and that he speaks, writes, and understands English sufficiently well. 
The usual minimum qualifications for entry to a first degree course in a university are good passes in the General Certificate of Education, the British School Leaving Examination, either three passes at ordinary level and two advanced level, or one at ordinary level and three at advanced level. A certificate which gives admission to a university in the candidate's own country will be taken into consideration for admission to a British university, but a university may still require passes in some subjects of the GCE or an equivalent examination. It should be noted that possession of the minimum entrance requirements does not guarantee admission. Selection is competitive and each application is judged on its merits. The British Council offices overseas and the Schools Council, 160 Great Portland Street, London W1N6LL, are prepared to offer advice on the acceptability of specific overseas qualifications in place of the British General Certificate of Education. A copy of the original certificate and, where appropriate, an approved translation should accompany all inquiries. Listening activity number 12. You are going to hear a talk on Canada. As you listen to the talk, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Good morning and welcome to this talk on Canada. Many people think of Canada as a land of ice and snow. They think of it as a young country with few inhabitants, a country of English-speaking white people. While some of this is true, it is also an inaccurate description of the country we call Canada. Canada lies in the northern half of the continent of North America. The most northern parts of Canada are sometimes called the land of the midnight sun because at certain times of the year the sun never sets and is still shining faintly at midnight. This northern part of Canada is cold and mostly snow-covered all year round. Most of the people who live in this northern part of Canada are called Inuit or Dene. They were once called Eskimos. They are the original people of this land and are part of what are called the First Nation. As we move to the more southern parts of Canada, the land changes and so does the people. Moving from east to west in southern Canada, we travel from the Atlantic provinces of Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. These small provinces with small populations border on the Atlantic Ocean. The land in these provinces is not very fertile, so fishing, forestry and mining are the main industries, although in some small areas agriculture is also important. If we travel west from the Atlantic provinces, we come to central Canada, composed of the large provinces of Quebec and Ontario. Both provinces are rich in natural resources, have fertile land and are the centres of industry for Canada's largest cities. Toronto and Montreal are found in these provinces. The province of Quebec is the centre of French language and culture in Canada. In fact, Montreal is the second largest French-speaking city in the world after Paris. Finally, in the far west of Canada, we come to the province of British Columbia. This province is separated from the prairies by the Rocky Mountains and is bounded on the west by the Pacific Ocean. British Columbia is often called simply the West Coast. British Columbia is an attractive place for tourists because of its mild climate, spectacular mountains, sea coast and beautiful forests. Agriculture, forestry, shipping and fishing are major industries in British Columbia. The people of this land of Canada are as varied as its landscape. The original settlers, those we call the people of the First Nations, came from Asia by crossing the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska. In their new environment, they developed many new languages and cultures. In the 16th century, the first Europeans arrived in eastern Canada. They came from Britain and France. 
By making treaties with the original inhabitants, they gradually established colonies in eastern and central Canada. After a war with France, Britain took over the French colonies in Quebec and eastern Canada. By the end of the 18th century, all of Canada was under British rule. From this time until the present century, most of the immigrants to Canada were British, Scottish and Irish. In this century, however, Canada has had an influence of settlers from all over the world. There are now hundreds of thousands of people from Asia, Africa and South America who now call Canada their home. Listening activity number 13. You are going to hear a conversation between two students. They are talking about the English bars. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces. Kevin, could you tell me something about the bars? I have never been to a bar. You see, Steve, my classmate, has invited me to go to a bar tonight. I see. You know, the word bar means a room in a pub. We say the bar when we mean the part of that room where drinks are kept. Soon after you go into the pub, you'll realize that nobody comes to the tables to take orders or money. Instead, customers go to the bar to buy their drinks. I see. People will go to the bar directly to get their drinks and don't wait for someone to come to take their orders. That's right. People don't queue at the bar, but they do wait till it's their turn. Oh, how do I pay? I mean, do I pay directly after I get the drink, or do I have to wait till I'm ready to leave like I do in a restaurant? It's not the custom to pay for all your drinks when you're ready to leave. Instead, you pay at the bar each time you get drinks. It helps if you're ready to pay as soon as you're served and you'll notice that many people wait with their money in their hands. I see. Do I have to give a tip? No. It's not the custom to give a tip. It's very common for friends to buy their drinks together in round. This means that each person takes a turn to buy drinks for everybody in the group. It's faster and easier, both for you and for the person serving, if drinks are bought in this way. Naturally, you don't have to have a drink in each round if you don't want one. That's interesting. When you're looking for somewhere to sit, remember that people have to leave their seats to get drinks, etc. So an empty seat may not in fact be available to you. If you're not sure whether a seat is free, ask someone sitting near it. When it's time for another drink, people usually take their glasses back to the bar to be filled again. If you're leaving, the friendly thing to do is to take your glasses back to the bar, thank the person who's been serving you, and say goodbye or good night. Thank you, Kevin. This helps me a lot. By the way, what kind of drinks are available in pubs? Well, you can get both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Beside alcoholic drinks, such as beer and wine, there is cider, which is made from apples usually sold in bottles, port, a type of thick sweet wine from Portugal, sherry, which is a type of wine from Spain, and spirits. These are a kind of strong alcoholic drinks such as whiskey and brandy. What about non-alcoholic? I don't drink alcohol. Well, they offer all kinds of fruit juices, such as orange and tomato. These drinks are usually sold in small bottles. And soft drinks, we often call sweet drinks, like Coke and Fanta. They are normally sold in small bottles or cans. And lemonade, which is a clear and sweet drink made with carbonated water. They also serve cordials. What are cordials? Cordials are strong and sweet drinks tasting of fruit, such as lime cordial, black currant cordial. They are often added to other drinks or drunk with water. I don't like sweet drinks. Are there any other non-alcoholic drinks? Yes, mineral water, but it's not available in all pubs. Kevin, one more question. What is VAT? I saw this on most goods in Britain. Well, VAT stands for Value Added Tax. 
The price shown on most goods in Britain includes a tax of 15%. If you use the retail export scheme, this tax can be returned to you if you take the goods with you when you leave Britain. You may have to spend a certain sum of money before you qualify for the scheme, and you'll have to show your passport. Ask in the shop if they operate the retail export scheme. If they do, the shop assistant will explain how you can get the tax back and fill in a form with you. VAT is also charged on hotel, restaurant bills, theater, cinema tickets, and car hire. Are these refundable? No, it's not refundable in these cases. Thank you very much. I really learned a lot. Listening activity number 14. You are going to hear a talk about the English pubs. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. In English pubs, the food is usually plain but of good quality. In fact, to taste good traditional English food, you would do well to visit a reputable pub. Many businessmen habitually have lunch in a pub near their office. In the country, the pub is often part of an inn where you can put up for the night. The Englishman's favourite drink is beer. There are three different methods of serving beer in Britain. As you'd expect, some beer is served in bottles. Beer that comes from a tap is called draught beer, and there are two different methods of serving it. Keg beer is served with modern method, which uses a gas called carbon dioxide, and traditional draught has no gas in it, and a pump is used to pull the beer up the pipe and out of the tap. Keg beer is served colder than traditional draught. It's easier to look after, and some keg beers are sold almost everywhere in Britain. This means that you can always have exactly the same drink in any pub that sells a particular keg beer. Traditional British beer is probably quite different from the beer in your country. It has no gas in it, and it's not served very cold. But this is not a mistake. Traditional beer drinkers will tell you that this allows you to taste the beer better. Traditional draught is not always looked after as well as it should be, but in a good pub, a traditional draught beer drinker will tell you there can be no better drink. There are a lot of different breweries, companies that make beer, in Britain, but they make the same types of beer, and you can see them in the list below. Lager is the kind of beer that is common in many countries. Normally keg is served cold, Strong lager is often available in bottles. Bitter is the most popular kind of British beer. It tastes slightly bitter and can be keg or traditional draught. Most pubs have more than one kind. Guinness is a thick, almost black, bitter-tasting Irish beer. Pale ale is less strong and a bit sweeter than bitter and often is keg. Mild is a fairly sweet beer, often dark, not as strong as bitter. It can be keg or traditional. It cannot be found everywhere. Bottled beers are sometimes served cold. There are several kinds available. For example, light ale like pale ale. Brown ale is a brown, often rather sweet beer. Stout is a very dark beer. Law regulates the pub's opening times. Local variations are possible, but usually a pub is open from half past 11 to 3 o'clock and from half past 5 to half past ten or eleven o'clock. Betting is forbidden in pubs. Children are not allowed on licensed premises, which may mean that father and mother cannot have a quiet drink together if children are with them. In the old days, when people drank too much and pubs were often rowdy, the law against children entering pubs was a wise one. Today, drunkenness is much less frequent than it was, say, fifty years ago. It would be quite wrong to consider the average English pub is anything other than a respectable, friendly place that provides good drink, good food and a pleasant social atmosphere. Far too often the foreigner has read accounts of sordid 19th century drinking places, haunted by people whose one desire was to drink as much as they could afford as quickly as possible. Unit 6. Summary Listening activity number 15. You are going to hear a talk about the tool ships race in Britain. As you listen, 
complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. In July 1956, a fleet of 21 sailing ships from 11 countries raced each other from Torbay in Devon to Lisbon. The ships had been converted from cargo carrying to sail training ships. However, their future seemed uncertain and the purpose of the gathering was to mark the passing of the age of the sail. What happened instead was that the sailing ships refused to say goodbye and two years later they raced again and the fleet was even larger. It was then that the title The Tall Ships was given to them and the name remains today. The original organisers, the Sail Training Ship International Race Committee, now called the Sail Training Association, saw that a new international movement had begun, adventure training under sail. As race succeeded race, it became clear that the events had more to do with bringing adventure and widening the horizons of young people than of commemorating the passing of sail. Now, sail training ships began to be specially built and young people from all walks of life wanted to participate. Now, to compete, a vessel has to satisfy just three requirements. It has to have a minimum waterline length of 9.09 metres. Half its crew must be between the ages of 16 and 25 and its principal means of propulsion must be a sail. Since 1972, the race has been sponsored by Cutty Sark Scott's Whiskey and it has started to attract huge crowds of spectators. In 1984, more than 250,000 people lined the River Mersey in Liverpool to watch the fleet set off. And in 1986, two million spectators joined Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at Newcastle-upon-Tyne to watch the parade. 1989 was the year that the spectacular Cutty Sark Tall Ships Race started from London. A grand fleet of up to 100 vessels gathered on the River Thames near Tower Bridge on Tuesday the 4th of July. The only thing that the racing yachts, ancient and modern, had in common was their young crews. Few were expert sailors and the majorities were strangers to the sea and to each other. Between Tuesday the 4th of July, when the fleet began to assemble, and Saturday the 8th of July, when the ships took part in a grand parade of sail down the River Thames, vessels were berthed on either side of Tower Bridge. Some were moored in the Pool of London, opposite the Tower of London, while others were moored to the east of Tower Bridge. Smaller vessels were accommodated in St Catherine's Dock, Many of the larger ships were open to the public. It was an amazing and historic spectacle as the ships sailed slowly up the River Thames. Listening activity number 16. You are going to hear a conversation about using recorded delivery and registered post. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Tom, where are you going? To the post office. I'm going to send some packets to Leeds. Do you know the best way to send them? Well, if your need is for a record of posting and delivery rather than compensation for loss, recorded delivery is particularly suitable for sending documents and papers of little or no monetary value. Well, what can we send for recorded delivery? All kinds of inland postal packets, except parcels, airway and railway letters and parcels. The service does not apply to mail for the Irish Republic. I see. How do I post them? You should get a certificate of posting form from the container in the post office and follow the instructions shown on the reverse. The certificate will be your record of posting. Can I send anything in the post? No, you can't. You must not send banknotes, currency notes and some valuable things because there is no special handling in the post. Recorded delivery mail is carried with the ordinary unregistered post and there is no special security treatment. How do we use recorded delivery? 
Well, when your letter or packet is delivered, it is signed for by the recipient, and a record is kept by the post office. The post office does not undertake to deliver recorded delivery or any other mail to the addressee in person, but to the address shown. You can obtain confirmation of delivery by completing an advice of delivery form either at the time of posting or later. This form will be signed by a post office official, not by the addressee of the recipient. A fee is payable, which is lower if the form is handed in at the time of posting. Is there any compensation for loss? Well, compensation is limited. Compensation may be paid for loss or damage, but will not be paid for money or any other inadmissible item. If you want a speedy service for articles of value with extra security of handling en route, and wish to have compensation in the event of loss or damage, you should use registered post. What can we send if we use registered post? Any first-class letter or packet, except airway letter or railway letter. How do we post? I mean, what should we do? Well, you should make sure that the packet is made up in a strong cover, and then it is fastened with wax, gum, or other adhesive substance. Hand the packet to the post office counter clerk, together with the cost of postage and the registration fee. Do not post it in the posting box. Make sure that the fee paid is adequate to cover the value of the content. The counter clerk will give you a certificate of posting, which he has initiated with the date stamped. Is there any special security for the registered post? Yes, all registered mail receives special security treatment. Packing is very important because registration is not in itself a safeguard against damage. The contents of registered packets must be adequately packed. How do we pack then? Do we have to use special envelope? Yes, you have to send the articles in one of the registered letter envelopes sold by the post office. These envelopes are already stamped for first-class postage and have the minimum registration fee. What about the compensation? Compensation will not be paid for the following articles. Such as banknotes, currency notes, trading stamps, coupons, and some valuable things, unless they are enclosed in one of the registered letter envelopes sold by the post office. I see. How does it deliver? The recipient on delivery signs for your registered mail. The post office does not undertake to deliver registered or any other mail to the addressee in person, but to the address shown. You can obtain confirmation of delivery by paying an additional fee and completing an advice of delivery form, either at the time of posting or later. If you require the recipient's signature on the advice of delivery, the form must be handed in at the time of posting. Otherwise, a post office official will sign the certificate. The advice of delivery fee is lower if the form is handed in at the time of posting. Thank you very much for all this useful information. Listening activity number seventeen. You are going to hear the first part of a lecture on American culture and American customs. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Well, last week we talked about American education. And today I'm going to discuss American values, characteristics, personal habits, and courtesies. Keep in mind as you are listening to this lecture that your goal is to understand, not to emulate or judge. Just briefly, I'd like to mention that there is a remarkable ethnic diversity in the United States. The population of the USA is about 260 million. 73 percent of the American population is white. Twelve percent is African American, eight percent Hispanic, three percent Asian or Pacific Islanders, and less than one percent American Indian or Eskimo. Many Americans resent generalizations being made about them because Americans see themselves as very unique and individualistic. On the other hand, Americans tend to lump foreigners together into one lot and condescendingly view foreigners as people who are not as intelligent. Or sensible as Americans, 
Despite Americans' dislike of generalizations and their ethnocentric point of view, it becomes evident that they are indeed American. Americans value individualism, independence, informality, directness, punctuality, achievement, and competition. Individualism is probably the most highly esteemed value in the American culture. And an important key to understanding American behavior. In the historical development of the country, individuality was crucial for survival. If you asked Americans to characterize the ideal person, they would probably use adjectives such as autonomous, independent, and self-reliant. Persons tend to be viewed as individuals rather than as representatives of a family or a group. Here are some examples of how this value affects behaviors. One, if a group of friends go to a restaurant, everyone wants to pay their own way. In other words, they want to have separate checks and not be someone's guest. Two, in friendships which seem to initially develop more quickly in the U.S. than in other cultures. The Americans may feel uncomfortable if you give them more help than they need. This is a tendency to draw back and see dependency as weakness. In some ways, the stress on the individual rather than the family or group has led to a more informal society. Sometimes, this lack of formality is viewed by members of other cultures as a sign of lack of respect. But that is not the intention in the American value system. This informality is even more predominant on the university campus than in other segments of society. Some ways in which you might see this value expressed in behaviors are: one, you will generally be on a first name basis with other students, in spite of any age differences. Two, dress is very informal on campus. Three, language is informal and sometimes confusing. Phrases like "see you later" and "drop by any time" are not meant literally; they are informal ways of saying goodbye. Americans are direct. Honesty and frankness are more important to Americans than saving face. They may bring up impolite conversation topics, which you may find embarrassing, too controversial, or even offensive. Americans are quick to get to the point. And do not spend much time on formal social amenities. This directness encourages Americans to talk over disagreements and to try to patch up misunderstandings themselves, rather than ask a third party to mediate disputes. It is particularly interesting to see what behaviors have culturally become associated with straightforwardness. One. A firm handshake somehow has come to be interpreted as a sign of sincerity. Two, looking at a person when you speak to him or her gives an indication of honesty. Three, in a question of honesty versus politeness, honesty wins. It is considered better to refuse graciously than to accept an invitation and not go. Four, you will be taken at your word. If you refuse food the first time it is offered, to be polite, it may not be offered again. An American will not know that your initial refusal is politeness. Great value is attached to time in the U.S. Punctuality is considered an important attribute. As with all values, there are different rules of acceptability in different cultures. In the U.S., you should be present for school or business appointments at the exact time agreed upon. In social appointments, you can arrive ten to fifteen minutes after the agreed upon time without giving offence. If you are invited somewhere for dinner and are more than fifteen minutes late, you will need to offer an apology and an explanation. A phone call explaining you have been detained and will be late will save face for you. And patience for the other person. Americans also value achievement and competition. The American style of friendly joking or banter, of getting the last word in, and the quick and witty reply are subtle forms of competition. 
Although such behaviour is natural to Americans, you may find it overbearing or disagreeable. Americans are obsessed with records of achievement in sports, and sports awards are often displayed in their homes. Also, sometimes books and movies are judged not so much on quality, but on how many copies are sold, or on how many dollars of profit are realised. Listening activity number eighteen. Now listen to the second part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below by writing no more than three words in the spaces provided. Many typically American characteristics: individualism, self-reliance, informality, punctuality, and directness are a result of those values mentioned earlier. Other national traits could also be identified. However, one, Americans cooperate. Although often competitive, Americans also have a good sense of teamwork and cooperate with others to achieve a goal. Two, Americans are friendly, but in their own way. In general, friendships among Americans tend to be shorter and more casual than friendships. Among people from other cultures, this has something to do with American mobility and the fact that Americans do not like to be dependent on other people. Americans also tend to compartmentalize friendships, having friends at work, family friends, friends on the softball team, etc. Three, Americans ask a lot of questions, some of which may to you seem pointless. Uninformed or elementary, someone you have just met may ask you very personal questions. No impertinence is intended. The questions usually grow out of a genuine interest. Four, Americans tend to be internationally naive. Many Americans are not very knowledgeable about international geography or world affairs. They may ask uninformed questions about current events. And may display ignorance of world geography. Because the U.S. is not surrounded by many other nations, some Americans tend to ignore the world. Five. Silence makes Americans nervous. Americans are not comfortable with silence. They would rather talk about the weather than deal with silence in a conversation. Six. Americans are open and usually eager to explain. If you do not understand certain behavior or want to know what makes Americans tick, do not hesitate to ask questions. Just as values and traits differ somewhat from one culture to another, so do the personal habits associated with good manners and courtesy. While very often there does not seem to be any particular reason why a particular way of doing something is considered good manners. Observing these cultural rules will make Americans more comfortable with you, and therefore you with them. It is, of course, impossible to cover all the possibilities here. If you are unsure in a situation, just ask. Americans like to be helpful. One, queuing up or lining up is essential. Courtesy requires that you do not push from behind, stand next to the person being helped. Or cut into a line. If you should accidentally bump someone, you should say, "Excuse me." Two, Americans blow their noses into a tissue. Spitting, clearing phlegm, or sniffing as from a cold are considered rude. Three, it is considered poor manners to slurp, chew noisily, or open your mouth while chewing. Four. Questions are seen as a good way of getting acquainted, but questions about a person's age, financial affairs, cost of clothing or personal belongings, religious affiliations, and sex life are considered too personal for questioning, except between very close friends. Five, men generally do not hold hands or link arms in public with other men. This is somewhat more acceptable between women. And quite common between men and women. Now, a few words about personal safety. Unfortunately, in the U.S., one must be aware of crimes. 
it is wise to be especially careful until you are familiar with the community in which you live. Remember that good judgment and common sense can significantly reduce chances of having an unpleasant and perhaps harmful experience. Basic safety rules include the following. 1. Do not walk alone at night. 2. When you leave your room, apartment or automobile, make sure that all doors are locked and all windows are secured. 3. Do not carry too much cash or wear jewellery of great value. 4. Never accept a ride from a stranger. Do not hitchhike and do not pick up hitchhikers. 5. Be careful of purses and wallets, especially in crowded metropolitan areas where there may be purse snatchers and pickpockets. 6. If a robber threatens you, at home or on the street, try not to resist unless you feel that your life is in danger and you must fight or run away. Give up your valuables as calmly as you can and observe as much as possible about the robber to tell the police when you report the crime. A final note. Keep an open mind. Don't judge what you see as right or wrong, but make it a challenge to try to understand the variety of American behaviours which you may observe. You certainly do not have to participate in something you disagree with, but you can try to understand it. This will help you build an attitude of intelligent and liberated respect for cultures, both your own and others. Listening activity number 19. You are going to hear a talk on two famous American presidents. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. Now listen to the talk. John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln lived in different times and had very different family and educational backgrounds. Kennedy lived in the 20th century while Lincoln lived in the 19th century. Kennedy was born in 1917, whereas Lincoln was born more than 100 years earlier, in 1809. As for their family backgrounds, Kennedy came from a rich family, but Lincoln's family was not wealthy. Because Kennedy came from a wealthy family, he was able to attend expensive private schools. He graduated from Harvard University. Lincoln, on the other hand, had only one year of formal schooling. In spite of his lack of normal schooling, he became a well-known lawyer. He taught himself law by reading law books. Lincoln was, in other words, a self-educated man. In spite of these differences in Kennedy and Lincoln's backgrounds, some interesting similarities between the two men are evident. In fact, Many books have been written about the strange coincidences in the lives of these two men. For example, take their political careers. Lincoln began his political career as a U.S. congressman. Similarly, Kennedy also began his political career as a congressman. Lincoln was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1847. Kennedy was elected to the House in 1947. They went to the Congress just 100 years apart. Another interesting coincidence is that each man was elected President of the United States in a year ending with the number 6-0. Lincoln was elected President in 1860 and Kennedy was elected in 1960. Furthermore, both men were President during years of civil unrest in the country. Lincoln was president during the American Civil War. During Kennedy's term of office, civil unrest took the form of civil rights demonstrations. Another striking similarity between the two men was that, as you probably know, neither lived to complete his term in office. Lincoln and Kennedy were both assassinated while in office. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas, after only 1,000 days in office. Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, a few days after the end of the American Civil War. 
It's rather curious to note that both presidents were shot while they were sitting next to their wives. These are only a few examples of the uncanny and unusual similarities between the destinies of these two American men, who had a tremendous impact on the social and political life of the United States and the imagination of the American people. Listening activity number twenty. You're going to hear a lecture on American history. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below. Now, listen to the lecture. The American Civil War was fought over one hundred and forty years ago. It began in eighteen sixty-one and lasted until eighteen sixty-five. The American Civil War. Resulted in the death of eight hundred thousand Americans. What caused this terrible civil war between the North and the South? Well, historians believe that there were many causes of the war. One of the important causes of the war was the friction between the North and the South over the issue of slavery. The Southern way of life and the Southern economy were based on the use of slave labor. For almost 250 years before the Civil War, the economy of the South depended on the use of black slaves. The slaves were used to plant and pick cotton and tobacco. Cotton and tobacco were the main crops grown in the South. Most Southerners did not think it was wrong to own, buy, or sell black slaves like farm animals. Slavery was, in fact, the foundation of the entire economy and way of life in the South. This was not the situation in the North. The Northern economy did not depend on the use of slave labor. Why not? Well, in the South, there were many large cotton plantations that used hundreds of black slaves. In the North, however, there were smaller farms. The Northern farmers planted many different kinds of crops, not just cotton or tobacco. The Northerners did not need slaves since their farms were smaller than most of the Southern plantations. In fact, many Northerners were so opposed to slavery that they wanted to end slavery completely. The Northern attitude against slavery made the Southerners angry. So, for many years before the war, there was constant friction between the North and the South over this issue. This friction eventually led to war. There was other friction too, as I said before, between the North and the South. There were, in other words, other causes of conflict between the North and the South. One involved the growth of industry in the North. While the South remained an agricultural area, the North became more and more industrialized. As industry increased in the North, it brought more people and greater wealth to the Northern states. As a result, many Southerners began to fear Northern political and economic domination. Because of this fear, many Southerners believed that the South should leave the Union and that they should form their own country. In 1860, the Southerners decided it was time to leave the Union when Abraham Lincoln became President of the United States. Lincoln, as you may know, was against slavery. The people of the South were afraid that their way of life and their economic system were in danger with Lincoln in the presidency. Consequently, the Southern states decided to secede from the Union. In other words, they wanted to break away from the North and form a separate country. In 1861, South Carolina seceded, and by June of 1861. Eleven southern states had seceded and established a new country. They called the new country the Confederate States of America. The war between the North and the South began when the southern states seceded from the Union. The main reason that the North went to war against the South was to bring the southern states back into the Union. In other words, the North went to war to keep the United States one country. After four years of terrible fighting, the North won the war against the South, 
and the United States remained one country. The North won the war mainly because of its economic and industrial strength and power. The Civil War had two important results for the United States. One, the Civil War preserved the United States as one country, and two, it ended slavery in the United States. Many Americans wonder what the United States would be like today if the South had won the Civil War. The history of the United States would have been very different if the South had won the war between the states.